we need to wake up. So many never realize that they need to study for themselves or possibly be deceived. Numbers and wealth and emotional spiritualism within a movement or denomination does not equal truth. See, every human has the right to pick up the Word of God and study it for himself. You know, the neat thing is, the Bible is a book written for all of creation, for every single human being. For each one of us to have knowledge and understanding about the truth of the reality of the world in which we live. The Word of God is truth. Amen. Every word written and every thought expressed in the Bible is important. And it's able to keep us from all the distractions and deceptions that will lead to so much heartache, so much brokenness, and eternal separation from our living Heavenly Father. How grateful we should be to have the Word of God. Yeah. It's not enough just to have our physical needs met by food and by shelter. Matthew 4, 4, we read, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. John 6, 35, And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. The Word of God is a road map to our final beautiful destination of eternal life. But it will take diligent study, seeking the truth to find the nourishment and the instruction needed. 2 Timothy 2.15, we read, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 3.16-17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It pen penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. I love that. I love that last part. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of our heart. How sweet is the truth of the Word of God to those who receive the truth and its unfailing light that stands forever. Psalms 119, 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And how wonderful it is that the Word of God isn't just some fleeting and changing all the time where we can't really depend on it. Psalms 119, 89, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Amen. Settled. Praise God. Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. John 8, 51, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Praise God. Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Matthew 24, 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Amen. 
You know, today there's an ep epidemic of ignoring and rejecting the Word of God. And just sleeping through life, oblivious to the importance of its instruction and its warnings. Many, so many don't realize the Word of God is perfect. And for man, it is without end. Wisdom comes as you receive this truth and live it out and let nothing sway you from it. Then prosperity and blessing comes as you individually embrace and apply this truth to your life. You can ignore it. You can read it. You can read about it. You can discard it. You can pick it apart. And you can toss aside whatever doesn't fit your current values. And you can apply only the words that suit you and the ones that are tasteful to you. And you can twist it until it's no longer truth. But only by reading all of it, understanding it, and completely applying it to your life will you receive eternal life. The understanding the Creator, understanding His plan of salvation, understanding His begotten Son, and understanding that His Spirit is given and made available to give life to you and to flow in you in love and to flow out of you in love. This is to truly live abundantly. So you can live in truth or you can perish without it. It's your choice. Scripture reveals the Father has set before each one of us life and death, blessing and cursing, and bids us to choose life so that you may live, you and your seed. Proverbs Four reveals the importance of getting wisdom and that wisdom will promote you. It's shocking that men generally just respond with, nah, I'm good without truth and instruction. Shocking, isn't it? <laughs> Living life without the understanding and the knowledge of the Word of God is like dressing up in surgical scrubs entering an operating room, and performing brain surgery on a patient without ever one time opening a medical book and reading it. It's very destructive. In the great controversy, we read this. Man, men cannot with impunity reject the warning of God, which God in mercy sends them. A message was sent from heaven to the world in Noah's day, and their salvation depended upon the manner in which they treated that message. Because they rejected the warning, the Spirit of God was withdrawn from the sinful race, and they perished in the flood, the waters of the flood. In the time of Abraham, mercy sent ceased to plead with the guilty inhabitants of Sodom, and all but Lot with his wife and two daughters were consumed by the fire sent down from heaven. So in the days of Christ, the Son of God declared to the unbelieving Jews of that generation, your house is left to you desolate. That's really sad words to hear. And looking down to these last days, the same infinite power declares concerning those who receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12. As they reject the teachings of his word in this last day, God withdraws his spirit and leaves them to the deceptions which they love. So the Bible explains it all. 
And then the Father and His begotten Son make it a daily reality for us. It tells us of the past. It tells us of the present. And it tells us of the future. It tells of horrific pain and suffering experienced by those who choose to ignore it. It tells of an incomprehensible blessed life for those of us who accept it and live it. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Amen. And it tells of the great loss of those who choose to disregard the truths of the Bible so they can follow a dark path instead of the light of life. And it tells of those who profess to have the truth and live it, but they're really desolate in the presence of God. Just empty temples. Like the five foolish virgins who have a regard for the truth, but they are empty of his presence. And they do not allow the Holy Spirit to work in their lives. In Matthew 23, 37 through 39, Jesus said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In the Desire of Ages, we read this. This should be a lesson to us. It should open our eyes to the power of Satan to deceive the mind that turns from the light of truth. Many follow in the track of the Pharisees. They revere those who have died for their faith. They wonder at the blindness of the Jews in rejecting Christ. But when obedience to God requires self-denial and humiliation, these very persons stifle their convictions and refuse obedience. Thus, they manifest the same spirit as did the Pharisees whom Christ condemned. They're sleeping in deceit. They don't even know it. Professing to be waiting for the Lord, but their lamps are empty. How can this be? They're lulled to sleep by the enemy. See, Satan is the enemy of the author of life, our Heavenly Father, who is the only one who has life and can give it to his creation. He's the only one who has life and can give it to each one of us. And it's always shocking to me to think of Satan who wants to have his throne above the one true God. He doesn't even recognize the very one who created him and is the very source of life for him. And the very one who will take that life away from him one day. Hallelujah. How confused he must be to place himself above his creator and his daily sustainer of all that provides life to him. But you know what? So many people forget who is the daily sustainer of life for them. Who is it that provides life and breath to you this very day? Just forget it. It's amazing. How do believers become lulled to sleep? How can they forget to recognize and remain connected to the source of their very breath, their very life. They don't recognize their condition. They don't get it. Maybe because they're content, content with their rituals, their elaborate pomp and circumstance and tradition that just puts them in a satisfied stupor of sleep. See, you can live your life under much sleep-inducing rituals and traditions that has absolutely nothing to do with the author of creation. 
no intimate fellowship with the Father or His Son, completely ignoring the one who reigns on high, He who gives you your breath at this very moment and determines your eternal life or your eternal separation. The Bible is to be highly regarded. Psalms 119, verses 104 through 105. Through your precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Amen. In Psalms 32, verse 8 through 9, the Lord promises, I will instruct you. I will teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like a horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near to me. The words written in the Bible are for all creation, to recognize the Creator in His everlasting beautiful ways. Some words in the Bible are specifically for the world and warnings for discarding its truth. Some of the words are specifically for the family of God, for encouragement, for instruction, for hope for us. In John 17, 17, Jesus is praying to the Father, and he's praying in this verse for the family of God, and he prays, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. But we must walk out this truth of the words of instruction. They are a shield for your life. In John 6, 63, Jesus says, The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. They testify of Jesus. But you must come to him in intimate relationship and live as an overflowing temple, walking under his care and his instruction. But somehow believers should just doze off and forget to seek him. And they forget to seek the abundant blessings promised to those who do seek him and make his truth not just so-so in my life, something I'll seek every once in a while, but they make his truth a priority. Number one in their life for a reason. Revelation 1 3 Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Amen. Matthew 5 6 Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Psalm 1 1 through 6 Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the path of sinners. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. It's so sad but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. You know, the enemy will send his own interpretation of the Bible, and he speaks his false reality through his instruments of darkness. And he has a purpose for this, to deceive you and to tempt you to believe his lies. He greatly twists the truth of the kingdom of God. And he attempts to hide the truth and to destroy those who love truth and will live it. He hates them. He hates them. That's not a reason to stop loving truth. In John 17, Jesus prays for his own who receive his words. He 
prays that they become one with the Father and the Son. He prays for these who are the family of God, the ones who receive the truth and live it. John 17, 14 highlights that they are hated for receiving the words of God and they're persecuted. He prays to the Father and says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they're not of the world, rejecting the word, just as he's not of the world. See, those who hate and persecute are desolate, empty temples. But the family of God can rejoice through the hate and the persecution because the day will come. He will return. He will take those who love his word and live it home. Amen. Hallelujah. Those who hate and persecute are empty because they reject the way, the truth, and the life. They love the lies of the enemy. And there is one who hates truth the most. You know who that is? The ancient serpent, the devil. He has perfected his artful schemes of taking each human up on the mountain and tempting each one with wealth and all that dazzles, tranquilizes, blinds, and utterly destroys any and all hope and chance for manifestation of the truth and its resulting glory in their lives. There is truth. And the Bible is the instruction book of hope, salvation, and life. There is one author of life. And then there's the deceiver. You have a choice to make. But the Father is just. And his angels record in the records of heaven what you have chosen to be your guide. And your resulting actions and your resulting behavior. Ephesians 5, 6 we read, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So many are asleep. So many believe they have the truth when they only have false reality, rituals, and so many traditions. So many are empty, like the empty temples of the five foolish virgins. They're deceived with worldly philosophy in empty words. Colossians 2, 8. Be, be aware, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. So many are peace so deceived. In the dark ages, the word was hidden. The written word was hidden so man couldn't study it to find the truth. Evil ruled during this dark time as it attempted to extinguish the truth. See, Satan's goal is to completely put out the truth. Completely put out the truth. He doesn't want a speck of it in you in me, in anyone. He wants us in complete darkness. He wants you, he wants to keep you from having truth. He wants instead to trick you to believe his version of the truth, which has not one ounce of truth or light in it. Amen. Not one ounce. It is complete darkness. Jeremiah 9, 6 read, Your dwelling place is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit, they refuse to know me, says the Lord. In Satan's false reality, the enemy wants to destroy who God is. The only true God, the Father. And then he tries to destroy who the Son is the begotten son. 
In all of his schemes, Satan gets your emotions involved. Never forget that. He gets your emotions all stirred up. Someone may present to you a belief or something they've been studying in the Bible. If you're not ready to hear it and don't really care about truth, you may emotionally react to them coming to you with truth. And you may say things like this, well, my grandfather said this was truth. Can you prove it in the word? Satan knows what a powerful influencer emotions are. See, some will leave the truth behind, the very truth of the kingdom of God, the truth that determines their eternal life or their eternal darkness. And they will leave the truth behind because Satan has deceived them and will continue to deceive them through their emotions by saying things like this. Well, my favorite teacher says this is truth. My favorite preacher says it's truth. It's got to be truth. My grandma was a staunch Catholic. And, oh, I loved her. I can't question what she taught me. Well, my family has attended this church for years. Or, uh, what about this one? Well, I went to school to learn theology. Do I dare question what I study? No, I must hold on to whatever they taught me, even if it's blatant lies from the enemy. No matter if it's truth or not, for the sake of my degree and my position. They never pick up the word for themselves and study it to prove the truth. They're asleep, and they're led by whatever they are told, by whatever their emotional influencer tells them. They're just desolate temples without the presence of God instructing them and guiding them. See, Jesus walked on earth, and he taught he taught the truth, the word of God. But they rejected the word of God. They rejected the truth. And because they rejected him who was sent, their temple became desolate. In these last days, we must be warned about being emotionally tied to a specific denomination without seeking truth of whether what they are teaching is truth or not. If you call yourself a believer, you need to pick up the Bible and prove your beliefs by the written word of God. Amen. And not, don't do it while you're just being led by your emotions, attempting to just try to prove your denomination is right. That doesn't prove truth. You go looking for truth. But instead, honestly, search the Bible, the Word of God Almighty for truth. If you're just desiring to prove your denomination is right and you sacrifice the truth because of it, then you are dangerously emotionally tied to your denomination. But this, this question, is this emotional tie to your denomination or to false teaching worth losing your eternal life? It may bring you temporal satisfaction. It might give you prestige within your group to hold on to that false teaching. It may be great, that church may be great at providing all kinds of social fun and social connections for you while you reject the truth. But 
But it also, that church, that denomination, may have hidden within it lies of the enemy so dark that God himself has had to walk out the doors and leave it desolate. If he was ever there to stop. In the great controversy, we read this. Whatever is built upon the authority of man will be overthrown. But that which is founded upon the rock of God's immutable word shall stand forever. Amen. We must seek truth and set aside emotions. We must set our hearts like flint and desire truth above all else. Otherwise, we can get distracted and think thoughts like this. Oh, but look how big and wealthy the Catholic system is. Look at all its political power. You know what? Satan can give all of that wealth and all of that political power just to deceive and to entice. Maybe may lead you to think things like, well, look how many Protestant churches there are in my town, almost on every corner. Mm -hmm. And the word of God warns, do not be deceived. Satan will attempt to, de to deceive the very elect. Now, I mentioned earlier the Dark Ages and it, how exceptionally blessed we are to have available to us the written word of God. Some may not realize the tragedy that happened in the Dark Ages, the time leading up to the Dark Ages, the Dark Ages, and the time, the years following. See, after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, the truth he taught while on this earth was a blazing light in the early apostolic church. But very quickly, the enemy began his usual evil attack on the truth. And gradually, for several centuries, <clears throat> the church began to be eclipsed by pagan traditions mingled with truth. Until finally, truth was snuffed out. <laughs> The apostolic church, which had been a fortress of truth, deteriorated into a corrupt political organization at the hands of the Roman government. Amen. They took the truth and they twisted it to meet their own selfish desires and evil agenda. They developed a religion that they call Christianity, but in reality, it's nothing like the truth of the kingdom of God. Nothing. It has no, not one ounce of truth in it. I want to take just a few minutes to list a few examples of the way the enemy twisted the truth through the Roman church. The Roman church, yes, the one that hated and persecuted believers of the truth of the kingdom of God. When I put the pictures up there, the pictures on the left depict the Roman ideas. The pictures on the right depict the word of God. Number one, the Bible doesn't regard Mary as a special saint. The Bible regards Mary as a pure woman honored by God to give birth to the Messiah. But in 325 A.D., the Church of Rome elevated Mary at the Council of Nicaea to the statue of a goddess and co-mediator with Christ. They twisted the truth. Number two, in the Bible, baptism was a ceremony reserved only for those old enough to make a rational decision for Christ. It represented being dead, buried to our old life, and being resurrected and born again to a new life in Christ. The ceremony was performed in a lake or a river where a person could be fully submerged. But the Roman church began to alter this ceremony. 
sprinkling or pouring was the new alternative because it was more convenient. This contradicted the example of Jesus. The Roman church theologians further corrupted the baptism ceremony of the Word of God and decided the event of baptism could only happen to members of their church and was to happen to newborns in case they do, died soon after birth. Well, obviously, no decision was made by the infant. This change happened because Roman theologians decided that a child could go to sin, could sin right away, which is an unbiblical concept. Number three, the Roman church also altered the Lord's Supper that Jesus had instituted. I wish I had an hour to go into all that. <laughs> Twisting of the truth. The Roman church introduced so many mystical pagan rituals, completely destroying the intent of Jesus of a beautiful and simple ceremony to remember his sacrifice and teaching. It's worth studying to find out the truth about the Lord's Supper. Number four, the Roman church also began to stray from the Ten Commandments eventually completely disregarding the words of God in the fourth commandment and leading millions to a false day of worship in disobedience to the word of God. In 1313 AD, the Roman Emperor Constantine published an edict of Milan establishing Sunday as a day of rest instead of the seventh day Sabbath as God designed in the fourth commandment. The change to the Sunday law had absolutely nothing to do with Christianity, but was to establish Sunday as a day of worship to the sun god Apollo. And today, this practice of Sunday worship as a Sabbath instead of the seventh day of the week is sadly followed by almost all profess, professing Christians without any question. Without any question. Millions. Without questioning or going to the Word of God in order to know the truth. To live the truth. And to obey the requirements of the Word of God. Number five, the Roman Catholic Church also introduced their doctrine of hellfire and purgatory, which is a distortion by pagan mythology. This false teaching was used to terrify and terrorize the common people who did not have the written word of God to read for themselves the truth about actually what happens to a person when they die. I strongly suggest going to the Word of God and reading what really happens when a person dies instead of believing what the Roman Catholics came up with about hellfire and purgatory. The Roman Church also altered the biblical teaching of confession of sin and forgiveness this false teaching of the Roman Church puts a mortal man in the place of Christ to grant the words of assurance that their sins are gone. This false doctrine has brought in and continues to bring in millions and millions of dollars for the building of their beautiful buildings, but it has nothing to do with the truth of the Word of God. Other truths of the kingdom of God as taught by Jesus and given as instruction in the word of God were altered. Many too many to list today. But the final one I'm going to mention is the doctrine of putting a mortal man in the position of God. They publicly state and manifest their belief that 
and I quote, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. That's for me. This is ultimately the very definition of blasphemy. The ultimate tragedy is that the Roman church instituted false heathen rituals in place of the truth taught by Christ. See, the leaders knew that they had to take away from the common people the written word of God, or the common people would read the word of God and see the, for themselves the discrepancies, and they would challenge the leaders. So the leaders removed from the common people the word of God. It was not available to people for 1,260 years. Can you imagine? This 1,260-year time period is known as the Dark Ages. The commoners were left without a Bible and were told they could never hope to understand the scriptures without assistance from the priest. We still hear that today, don't we? That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, he will teach you truth. Amen. He will write it on your heart. Amen. So therefore, in the dark ages, the commoners were being kept in darkness by a corrupt political organization who deceived and hid the truth and changed worship to pagan gods and rituals. That time period was a time of horrible spiritual deterioration, much like today. Finally, the word of God was printed again and made available. But the organization had made such an impact on this earth and in the minds and hearts of the people, so much that today still reigns all of their false doctrines. And it reigns not only in their church, but the churches who have adopted their practices without even knowing they were doing it. It still reigns. And millions and millions have gone to their graves believing that was the truth. Instead of recognizing the lies and deceptions of the enemy and how he deceived them. Many today are still living in this and need to wake up. Because today, thank God the Bible is available. And it's waiting for each and every one of us to pick it up and study for yourself to know the truth. Not just to blindly follow some pagan false religion. But how many today who are emotionally tied to their religious organization and denomination allow their church leaders to dictate to them twisted lies? Millions. And they do this without recognizing this is exactly what happened to those in the dark ages. They just let those at the top of their denominations interpret it for them and spoon feed it to them. Here you go. Just believe it. Just trust me. They're just feebly giving in to their leader's personal interpretation, which maybe they know it's truth, maybe they don't. I mean, maybe they know it's not truth. Maybe they don't. But we need to wake up. So many never realize that they need to study for themselves or possibly be deceived. See, every human has the right to pick up the Word of God and study it for himself. Yeah. Every human. Don't let anyone tell you, you do not have the right to pick it up, to question the beliefs of your denomination, and to find out the truth yourself. Amen. Not just blindly follow an organization or your favorite leader. 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved of God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, 
rightly dividing the word of truth. Why would someone not want to study the word of God so you have the truth? Maybe because, like I said, you're emotionally tied to your denomination and you're maybe afraid that the truth is not what your denomination is teaching. Maybe because Grandpa could be shown to be wrong. Or maybe my favorite teacher, preacher, could be shown to be wrong. Or their school of theology could be shown to be teaching things that do not line up with the Word of God. And maybe they might say, well, that's just one issue that can't be that important. Besides, we have so many other good truths. Now, every word of the Bible is important. Every word of the Bible is important. How does a mere human have the spiritual intelligence to know which truths are the most important and which truths are not. A spiritual arrogance to say, ah, I don't believe that's important. It's in the Bible. It's important. Amen. Maybe they're just being used by the enemy as an instrument of darkness to keep you from finding the truth. If that's the case, if someone is being used as an instrument of darkness to keep you from believing the truth, and they get angry at you or try to shame you for searching the Word of God for truth, how very sad and how very evil of them. You know when a person regularly drinks alcohol with their usual group of buddies or maybe just with their spouse when they get home every single night. They just know, well, this is what the group does. This is what we've done for years as a group. It's all of us. And then one day, one of them decides that he needs to quit drinking alcohol because he wants to get healthy. And he shares that decision with his friends. But sometimes they question his decision. And sometimes they get so angry because he's looking for something better. And it disturbs their regular routine. Their anger is not about him making a decision to get more healthy. Their anger is about the conviction they are experiencing in their own life about their drinking problem. It's no different when a person decides to study the truth. It is amazing that so many people cringe and get angry, I mean angry, when you question a topic in the Bible that you've been given some thought about. I'm not sure that's true. I'm going to start studying that for myself. They get angry. And they try to shame you. They won't listen to the person who is truly studying and seeking truth. They just rely on other people's opinions. Well, doesn't your eternity, where you are going to spend eternity, matter more to you than just to blindly follow? Some are afraid of what truth they may actually find. But I've been believing this for so long. Or I might have to walk out of that church never to return. And all my family and all my friends believe this way. Where would I go? Well, you can stay in that denomination without the truth. And you can follow them into eternal separation from truth. You can do that. The Bible instructs us to study, to read, to meditate day and night, and to teach it truth. John 8, 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you 
free. No one has the right to shame you, to degrade you into just blindly following their lead. And if they must resort to shame and criticism, that is your first clue who is inspiring their empty hearts. Amen. Such actions of shame, anger, criticism at you for wanting to look at the truth, that's from the evil one attempting to keep his game of hide the truth going. Never allow anyone to take that freedom away from you. <clears throat> Watch out for evil emotional manipulation. Be diligent. Read, study, pray, and know the truth of God's word and live it. Amen. Jesus said, those who follow me and obey my commandments will inherit the kingdom of God. They're the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes, and they have eternal life. Amen. John 14, 24, he who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. 1 John 2, 3 through 5. Now by this we know him. If we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. I urge all believers to wake up. Wake up before it's too late. Wake up and honor God. Honor his word. It's like we don't even fear him anymore. Don't study. Don't fear him. You don't study Revelation 14, 6 through 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. You won't be able to... He's not saying, take some twisted pagan ritual and teach it. He's saying the everlasting gospel and preach that. To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud, gospel, loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. Amen. When are we going to take this message seriously? Time is short. And then we read the angel's message in Revelation 18, 1 through 4. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and has become a dwelling for demons, a prison for every foul spirit, a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Mm -hmm. The people of God are called upon to separate from all communion with all untruth in the system of religion, systems of religion that promotes such evil. Thankfully, we're told not to despair if we lack wisdom of the Word of God. In James 1, verse 5, we read, If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. In closing, and lest we forget who the authority 
of this universe is and just how important the truth of the Word of God is. Let's read Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself, and he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Amen. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen.